Section 32 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Duvnov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Manik Baisho, Portugal. Chapter 29. The Expulsion from Moscow. 1. Preparing the Blow. The year 1891 had arrived. The air was full of evil forebodings. In the solitude of the government chancelleries of St. Petersburg, the anti-Jewish conspirators were assiduously at work, preparing for a new blow to be dealt to the martyred nation. A secret committee attached to the Ministry of the Interior under the chairmanship of Plev was engaged in framing a monstrous enactment of Jewish counter-reforms which were practically designed to annul the privileges conferred upon certain categories of Jews by Alexander II. The principal object of the proposed enactment was to slam the doors to the Russian interior which had been slightly opened by the laws of 1859 and 1865 by withdrawing the privilege of residing outside the pale, which these laws had conferred upon Jewish first guild merchants and artisans, subject to a number of onerous conditions. The first object of the reactionary conspirators was to get rid of those privileged Jews who lived in the two Russian capitals. In St. Petersburg, this object was to be attained by the Edict of Gresser, referred to previously, which were followed by other similar harassing regulations. In February 1891, the governor of St. Petersburg ordered the police to examine the kind of trade pursued by the Jewish artisans of St. Petersburg with the end in view of expelling from the city and confiscating the goods of all those who should be caught with articles not manufactured by themselves. A large number of expulsions followed upon this order. The principal blow, however, was to fall in Moscow. The ancient Moscovite capital was in the throes of great changes. The post of Governor-General of Moscow, which had been occupied by Count Dolgorsky, was entrusted in February 1891 to a brother of the Tsar, Grand Duke Sergius. The Grand Duke, who enjoyed an unenviable reputation in the gambling circles of both capitals, was not burdened by any consciously formulated political principles. But this deficiency was made up by his steadfast loyalty to the political and religious prejudices of his environment among which the blind hatred of Judaism occupied a prominent place. The Russian public was inclined to attach extraordinary importance to the appointment of the Tsar's brother. It was generally felt that his selection was designed to serve as a preliminary step to the transfer of the imperial capital from St. Petersburg to Moscow, symbolizing the return home to the old Moscovite political ideals. It is almost superfluous to add that the contemplated change made it necessary to purge the ancient capital of its Jewish inhabitants. The Jewish community of Moscow, numbering some 30,000 souls who lived there legally or semi-legally, had long been a thorn in the flesh of certain influential Russian merchants. The burgomaster of Moscow, Alexeyev, an ignorant merchant with a very shady reputation, was greatly wrought up over the far-reaching financial influence of a local Jewish capitalist, Lazarus Polakov, the director of a rural bank, with whom he had clashed over some commercial transaction. Alexeyev was only too grateful for an occasion to impress upon the highest government spheres that it was necessary to clear Moscow of the Jews who were crowding the city owing to the indulgence of Dolgursky, the former governor-general. 
the reactionaries of Moscow and St. Petersburg joined hands in the worthy cause of extirpating Judaism and received the blessing of the head of the Holy Synod, Pobedonoschev. This inquisitor-in-chief appointed Istomin, a ferocious anti-Semite, who had been his general utility man at the Holy Synod, the bureau manager of the new governor-general, and thus succeeded in establishing his influence in Moscow through his acting representative, who was practically the master of the second capital. The secret council of Jew haters decided to accomplish the Jewish evacuation of Moscow prior to the solemn entrance of Grand Duke Sergius into the city, either for the purpose of clearing the way for the new satrap or in order to avoid the unpleasantness of having his name connected with the first cruel act of expulsion. Pending the arrival of Sergius, the administration of Moscow was entrusted to Kostanda, the chief of Moscow military district, an adroit Greek who was to begin the military operations against the Jewish population. The first blow was timed to take place on the festival of Israel's liberation from Egyptian bondage, as if the eternal people needed to be reminded of the new bondage and of the new pharaohs. 2. The Horrors of Expulsion It was March 29, 1891, the first day of Jewish Passover, when, in the synagogues of Moscow, which were filled with worshippers, an alarming whisper ran from mouth to mouth, telling of the publication of an imperial ukase ordering the expulsion of the Jews from the city. Soon afterwards, the horror-stricken Jews read in the papers the following imperial order dated March 28. Jewish mechanics, distillers, brewers, and in general, master workmen and artisans shall be forbidden to remove from the Jewish Pale of Settlement, as well as to come over from other places of the empire to the city and government of Moscow. This prohibition of settling in Moscow anew was only one half of the edict. The second, more terrible half was published on the following day. A recommendation shall be made to the Minister of the Interior after consultation with the Governor-General of Moscow to see to it that measures be taken to the effect that the above-mentioned Jews should gradually depart from the city and government of Moscow into the places established for the permanent residence of the Jews. At first sight, it seemed difficult to realize that this harmless surface of the UK's with its ambiguous formulation concealed a cruel decree of ordering the uprooting of thousands of human beings. But those who were to execute this written law received definite unwritten instructions which were carried out according to all the rules of the strategic game. Footnote. The Byzantine perfidy of this formulation lies in the phrase above mentioned Jews which gives the impression of referring to those that had removed to Moscow from other parts of the empire, i.e. settled there anew, whereas the real object of the law was to expel all the Jews of the above-mentioned categories of master workmen and artisans, even though they may have lived in the city for many years. This amounted to a repeal, illegally enacted outside the Council of State of the Law of 1865, conferring the right of universal residence upon Jewish artisans. Moreover, the enactment was given retroactive force, a step which even the originators of the temporary rules of May 3rd were not bold enough to make. In distinction from the May laws, the present decree was not even submitted to the Council of Ministers, where a discussion of might have been demanded. It was passed as an extraordinary measure at the suggestion of the Ministry of the Interior, represented by Durnubo and Plev. This is indicated by the heading of the UK's. The Minister of the Interior has applied most humbly to His Imperial Majesty, begging permission to adopt the following measures. This succession of illegalities 
was to be veiled by the ambiguous formulation of the ukase and the addition of the hackneyed stipulation pending the revision of the enactments concerning the jews in the ordinary course of legislation End of footnote. the first victims were the jews who resided in moscow illegally or semi-legally the latter living in the suburbs they were subjected to a certain nocturnal attack a raid which was directed by the savage Cossack general Yurkovsky, the police commissioner in chief. During the night following the promulgation of the U case, a large detachment of policemen and firemen made their appearance in the section of the city called Zariedie, where the bulk of the illegal Jewish residents were huddled together, more particularly in the immense so called Glebov Yard, the former ghetto of Moscow. The police invaded the Jewish homes, aroused the scared inhabitants from their beds, and drove the semi-naked men, women, and children to the police stations, where they were kept in filthy cells for a day and sometimes longer. Some of the prisoners were released by the police, which first wrested from them a written pledge to leave the city immediately. Others were evicted under a police convoy, and sent out of the city like criminals through the transportation prison. Many families, having been forewarned of the impending raid, decided to spend the night outside their homes to avoid arrest and maltreatment at the hands of the police. They hid themselves in the outlying sections of the city and on the cemeteries. They walked or rode all over the city the whole night. Many an estimable Jew was forced to shelter his wife and children, stiffened from cold, in the houses of ill repute, which were open all night. But even these fugitives ultimately fell into the hands of the police inquisition. Such were the methods by which Moscow was purged of its rightless Jewish inhabitants a whole month before Grand Duke Sergius made his entrance into the city. The Grand Duke was followed soon afterwards, in the month of May, by the Tsar himself, who stopped in the second Russian capital on his way to the Crimea. A retired Jewish soldier was courageous enough to address a petition to the Tsar, imploring him in touching terms to allow the former Jewish soldiers to remain in Moscow. The request of the Jewish soldier met with a quick response. He was sent to jail and subsequently evicted. The establishment of the new regime in Moscow was followed, in accordance with provisions of the recent ukase, by the gradual expulsion of the huge number of master workmen and artisans who had enjoyed for many years the right of residence in the city and were now suddenly deprived of this right by a despotic caprice. The local authorities, included among the victims of expulsion, even the so-called circular Jews, i.e. those who had been allowed to remain in Moscow by virtue of the ministerial circular of 1880, granting the right of domicile to the Jews living there before that date. This vast host of honest and hard-working men, artisans, tradesmen, clerks, teachers, were ordered to leave Moscow in three installments. Those having lived there for not more than three years, and those unmarried and childless, were to depart within three to six months. Those having lived there for not more than six years and having children or apprentices to the number of four were allowed to postpone their departure for six to nine months. Finally, the old Jewish settlers who had big families and employed a large number of working men were given a reprove from nine to twelve months. It would almost seem as if the maximum and minimum dates within each term were granted specifically for the purpose of yielding an enormous income to the police, which, for a substantial consideration, could postpone the expulsion of the victims for three months and thereby enable them to wind up their affairs. At the expiration of the final terms, the unfortunate Jews were not allowed to remain in the city even for one single day. Those that stayed behind were ruthlessly evicted. 
an eyewitness in summing up the information at his disposal, the details of which are even more heart-rending than the general facts, gives the following description of the Moscow events. People who had lived in Moscow for 20, 30, or even 40 years were forced to sell their property within a short time and leave the city. Those who were too poor to comply with the orders of the police or who did not succeed in selling their property for a mere song, there were cases of poor people disposing of their whole furniture for one or two rubles, were thrown into jail or sent to the transportation prison, together with criminals and all kinds of riffraffs that were awaiting their turn to be dispatched on the convoy. Men who had all their lives earned their bread by the sweat of their brow found themselves under the thumb of prison inspectors, who placed them at once on an equal footing with criminals sentenced to hard labor. In these surroundings, they were sometimes kept for several weeks and then dispatched in batches to their homes, which many of them never saw again. At the threshold of the prison, the people belonging to the unprivileged estates, the artisans were almost without exception members of the burger class, had wooden handcuffs put on them. It is difficult to state accurately how many people were made to endure these tortures, inflicted on them without the due process of law. Some died in prison pending their transportation. Those who could manage to scrape together a few pennies left for the pay of settlement at their own expense. The sums speedily collected by their co-religionists, though not inconsiderable, could do nothing more than rescue a number of the unfortunates from jail, convoy, and handcuffs. But what can there be done when thousands of human nests lived in for so many years are suddenly destroyed, when the catastrophe comes with the force of an avalanche so that even the Jewish heart, which is open to sorrow, cannot grasp the whole misfortune? Despite the winter cold, people hid themselves on cemeteries to avoid jail and transportation. Women were confined in railroad cars. There were many cases of expulsions of sick people who were brought to the railroad station in conveyance and carried into the cars on stretchers. In those rare instances in which the police physician pronounced the transportation to be dangerous, the authorities insisted on the chronic character of the illness and the sufferers were brought to the station in writing pain, as the police could not well be expected to wait until the invalids were cured of their chronic ailments. Eyewitnesses will never forget one bitterly cold night in January 1892. Crowds of Jews dressed in beggarly fashion, among them women, children, and old men, with remnants of their household belongings lying around them, filled the station of the Brest Railroad. Threatened by the police convoy and transportation prison, and having failed to obtain a reprieve, they have made up their mind to live despite a temperature of 30 degrees below zero. Fate, it would seem, want to play a practical joke on them. At the representations of the police commissioner in chief, the governor general of Moscow had ordered to stop the expulsions until the great cold had passed, but the orders were not published until the expulsion had been carried out. In this way, some 20,000 Jews who had lived in Moscow 15, 25, and even 40 years were forcibly removed to the Jewish Pale of Settlement. 3. Effect of Protests All these horrors, which remind one of the expulsion from Spain in 1492, were passed over in complete silence by the Russian public press. The cringing and reactionary papers would not, and the liberal paper could not, report the exploits of the Russian government in their war against the Jews. The liberal press was ordered by the Russian censor to refrain altogether from touching on Jewish question. The only Russian Jewish press organ which, defying the threat of the censor, had dared to fight against official Russian Judeophobia, the Voskhod, had been suppressed already in March, 
before the promulgation of the Moscow Expulsion Edict for the extremely detrimental course pursued by it. A similar fate overtook the Novosti of St. Petersburg, which had printed a couple of sympathetic articles on the Jews. In this way, the government managed to gag the independent press on the eve of its surprise attack upon Moscow Jewry, so that everything could be carried out noiselessly under the veil of a state secret. Fortunately, the foreign press managed to unveil the mystery. The government of the United States, faced by a huge immigration tide from Russia, sent in June 1891 two commissioners, Weber and Kempster, to that country. They visited Moscow at the height of the expulsion fever and, traveling through the principal centers of the Pale of Settlement, gathered carefully sifted documentary evidence of what was being perpetrated upon the Jews in the Empire of the Tsar. While decimating the Jews, the Russian government was at the same time anxious that their cries of distress should not penetrate beyond the Russian border. Just about that time, Russia was negotiating a foreign loan in which the Rothschild of Paris were expected to take a leading part and found it rather inconvenient to stand forth in the eyes of Europe as the ghost of medieval Spain. It was this consideration which prompted the softened and ambiguous formulation of the Moscow Expulsion Decree and made the government suppress systematically all mention of what happened afterwards. Notwithstanding these efforts, the cries of distress were soon heard all over Europe. The Russian censorship had no power over the public opinion outside of Russia. The first Moscow refugees who had reached Berlin, Paris, and London reported what was going on at Moscow. Already in April 1891, the European financial press began to comment on the fact that the Jewish population of Russia is altogether irreplaceable in Russian commercial life, forming a substantial element which contributes to the prosperity of the country, and that, therefore, the expulsion of the Jews must of necessity greatly alarm the owners of Russian securities who are interested in the economic progress of Russia. Soon afterwards, it became known that Alphonse de Rothschild, the head of the great financial firm in Paris, refused to take a hand in floating the Russian loan of half a billion. The first protest of the financial king against the anti-Semitic policy of the Russian government produced a sensation, and it was intensified by the fact that it was uttered in France at a time when the diplomats of both countries were preparing to celebrate the Franco-Russian alliance which was consummated a few months afterwards. The expulsion from Moscow found a sympathetic echo on the other side of the Atlantic. President Harrison took occasion in a message to Congress to refer to the suffering of the Jews and to the probable effects of the Russian expulsion upon America. This government has found occasion to express in a friendly spirit but with much honestness to the government of the Tsar is serious concern because of the harsh measures now being enforced against the Hebrews in Russia. By the revival of anti-Semitic laws long in abeyance, great numbers of those unfortunate people have been constrained to abandon their homes and leave the empire by reason of the impossibility of finding subsistence within the pale to which it is sought to confine them. The immigration of these people to the United States, many other countries being closed to them, is largely increasing and is likely to assume proportions which may make it difficult to find homes and employment for them here and to seriously affect the labor market. It is estimated that over one million will be forced from Russia within a few years. The Hebrew is never a beggar. He has always kept the law, life by toil, often under severe and oppressive restrictions. It is also true that no race, sect, or class has more fully cared for its own than the Hebrew race. 
but the sudden transfer of such a multitude on the condition that tend to strip them of their small accumulations and to depress their energies and courage is neither good for them nor for us. The banishment, whether by direct decree or by not less certain indirect methods, of so large a number of men and women is not a local question. A decree leave one country is in the nature of things an order to enter another, some other. This consideration, as well as the suggestion of humanity, furnishes ample ground for the remonstrances which we have presented to Russia. While our historic friendship for that government cannot fail to give assurance that our representations are those of a sincere well-wisher. The sentiments of the American people were voiced less guardedly in the resolution, which was passed by the House of Representatives on July 21, 1892. Resolved that the American people, through their senators and representatives in Congress assembled, do hereby express sympathy for the Russian Hebrews in their present condition, and the hope that the government of Russia, a power with which the United States has always been on terms of amity and goodwill, will mitigate as far as possible the severity of the laws and decrees issued respecting them, and the President is requested to use his good offices to notify the government of Russia to mitigate the said laws and decrees. The highly placed Jew painters of St. Petersburg were filled with rage. The Novoye Vremia emptied its invectives upon the Chitovsky financiers, referring to the refusal of Alphonse de Rothschild to participate in the Russian loan. Nevertheless, the government found itself compelled to stem the tide of oppression for a short while. We have already had occasion to point out that the government had originally planned to reduce the Jewish elements also in the city of St. Petersburg, whose head, the brutal aggressor, had manifested his attitude towards the Jews in a series of police circulars. Following upon the first raid of the Moscow police on the Jews, aggressor ordered his gendarmes to search at the St. Petersburg railroad stations for all Jewish fugitives from that city, who might have ventured to flee to St. Petersburg and to deport them immediately. In April, there were persistent rumors afloat that the government had decided to remove, by degrees, all Jews from St. Petersburg and thus make both Russian capitals Juden Rhein. The financial blow from Paris cooled somewhat the ardor of the Jew baiters on the shores of the Neva. The wholesale expulsions from St. Petersburg were postponed, and the Russian anti-Semites were forced to satisfy their cannibal appetite with the consumption of Moscow Jewry, whose annihilation was carried out systematically under the cover of bureaucratic secrecy. 4. Fogrom Interludes Under the effect of the officially perpetrated legal pogroms, Little attention was paid to the street pogrom which occurred on September 29, 1891, in the city of Starodub, in the government of Chernigov, recalling the horrors of the 80s. Though caused by economic factors, the pogrom of Starodub assumed a religious coloring. The Russian merchants of the city had long been gnashing their teeth at their Jewish competitors. Led by a Russian fanatic, by the name of Gladkov, they forced the regulation through the local town council, barring all business on Sundays and Christian holidays. The regulation was directed against the Jews, who refused to do business on the Sabbath and the Jewish holidays, and who would have been ruined had they also refrained from training on Sundays and the numerous Greek Orthodox holidays, thus remaining idle on twice as many days as the Christians. The Jews appealed to the governor of Chernigov to revoke or at least to mitigate the new regulation. The governor's decision fell in favor of the Jews who were allowed to keep their stores open on Christian holidays from noontime until 6 o'clock in the evening. The reply of the local Jew baiters took the form of a pogrom. 
On Sunday, the day before Yom Kippur, when the Jews opened their stores for a few hours, a hired crowd of ruffians from among the local street mob fell upon the Jewish stores and began to destroy and loot whatever goods it could lay its hands on. The stores having been rapidly closed, the rioters invaded the residences of the Jews, destroying the property contained there and filling the streets with fragments of broken furniture and letters from torn bedding. The plunderers were assisted by the peasants, who had arrived from the adjacent villages. In the evening, a drunken mob, which had assembled on the marketplace, laid fire to a number of Jewish stores and houses, inflicting on their owners a loss of many millions. All this took place during the holy Yom Kippur Eve. The Jews, who did not dare to worship in their synagogues or even to remain in their homes, hid themselves with their wives and children in the garrets and orchards or in the houses of strangers. Many Jews spent the night in a field outside the city where, shivering from cold, they could watch the glare of the ghastly flames which destroyed all their belongings. The police, small in numbers, proved powerless against the huge hordes of plunderers and incendiaries. On the second day, the program was over, the work of destruction having been duly accomplished. The subsequent judicial inquiry brought out the fact clearly that the program had been engineered by Gladkov and his associates, a fact of which the local authorities could not have been ignorant. Gladkov fled from the city, but returned subsequently, paying but a slight penalty for his monstrous crime. It should be added, however, that the government was greatly displeased with the reappearance of the terrible specter of 1881, as it only tended to throw into bolder relief the policy of legal programs by which Western Europe was alarmed. As a matter of fact, already in October, the semi-official Krasdanin had occasion to print the following news item. Yesterday, October 15, the financial market abroad was marked by depression. Our securities have fallen owing to the new rumors concerning alleged contemplated measures against the Jews. Commenting upon this, the paper declared that these rumors were entirely unfounded for the reason that at the present time, all our government departments are weighed down with problems of first-rate national importance which brook no delay, and they could scarcely find time to busy themselves with such matters as the Jewish question, which requires mature consideration and slow progress in action. The subdued tone adopted by Count Meshersky, the court journalist, was only partially in accord with the facts. He was right in stating that the terrible countrywide distress had compelled the deadly enemies of Judaism to pause in the execution of their entire program. But he forgot to add that the one clause of that program, the realization of which had already begun, the expulsion from Moscow was being carried into effect with merciless cruelty. The huge emigration wave resulting from this expulsion through upon the shores of Europe and America, the victims of persecution who re-echoed the cries of distress from the land of the Tsars. Soon afterwards, a new surprise without parallel in history was sprung upon a baffled world. The Russian government was negotiating with the Jewish philanthropist Baron Hirsch concerning the gradual removal of the three millions of its Jewish subjects from Russia to Argentina. End of section 32. Section 33 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland. Volume 2. From the Death of Alexander I until the Death of Alexander III. 1825 to 1894. By Shimon Duvnov. Translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S. S. Kim, Manik de Baisho, Portugal. Chapter 30 Baron Hirsch's Emigration Scheme and Unrelieved Suffering 1. Negotiations with the Russian Government 
Towards the end of the 80s, the plan of promoting Jewish emigration from Russia, which had been abandoned with the retirement of Count Ignatiev, was again looked upon favorably by the leading government circles. The sentiments of the Tsar were expressed in a marginal note which he attached to the report of the governor of Podolia for the year 1888. The passage of the report in which it was pointed out that the removal of the Jewish proletariat from the monarchy would be very desirable was supplemented in the Tsar's handwriting by words and even very useful. In reply to the proposal of the governor of Odessa to deprive Jewish emigrants of the right to return to Russia, the Tsar answered with a decided yes. The official Russian chronicler goes even so far as to confess that it was part of the plan to stimulate the emigration of the Jews as well as that of the German colonists by a more rigorous enforcement of the military duty, a design which, from the political point of view, may well be pronounced criminal and which was evidently at the bottom of the severe military fines imposed upon the Jews. The same open-hearted chronicler adds, It may be easily understood how sympathetically the government received the proposal of the Jewish Colonization Association in London, which had been founded by Baron de Hirsch in 1891 to remove, in the course of 25 years, 3,250,000 Jews from Russia. The name of Boris de Hirsch was not unknown to the Russian government. For a few years previously, it had had occasion to carry on negotiations with him, with result of which it had scant reason to boast. This great German-Jewish philanthropist, who was resolved to spend hundreds of millions on the economic and agricultural advancement of his co-religionists in Eastern Europe, had donated in 1888 50 million francs for the purpose of establishing in Russia arts and craft schools, as well as workshops and agricultural farms for the Jews. It was natural for him to assume that the Russian government would only be too glad to accept his enormous contribution, which was bound to stimulate productive labor in the country and raise the welfare of its destitute masses. But he had forgotten that the benefits expected from the fund would accrue to the Jewish proletariat, which according to the catechism of Jew hatred, was to be removed from the monarchy. The stipulation made by the Russian government to the representatives of Baron Hirsch was entirely unacceptable. It insisted that the money should not be handed over to Jewish public agencies, but to the Russian government, which would expand it as it saw fit. Somebody conceived the shameful idea which was accepted by the representatives of Baron Hirsch of propitiating Pobedonovschev by a gift of a million francs for the needs of his pet institution, the Greek Orthodox parochial schools. The gift was accepted, but Hirsch's proposal was declined. Thus it came about that the Russian Jews were deprived of a network of model schools and educational establishments while a million of Jewish money went to swell the number of the ecclesiastic Russian schools, which imbued the Russian masses with crass ignorance and anti-Semitic prejudices. The Shirish millions, originally intended for Russia, went partly towards the establishment of Jewish schools in Galicia, a work which met with every possible encouragement from the Austrian government. The generous Jewish philanthropist now realized that the assistance he was anxious to render to his Russian colleagueists could not take the form of improving their condition in their own country, but rather that of settling them outside of it by organizing the emigration movement. Hirsch's attention was called to the fact that, beginning with 1889, several groups of Russian Jews had settled in Argentina and, after incredible hardships, had succeeded in establishing there several agricultural colonies. The Baron sent an expedition to Argentina under the direction of Professor Leventhal, an authority on hygiene, 
for the purpose of investigating the country and finding out the places fit for colonization. The expedition returned in March 1891, and Hirsch decided to begin with the purchase of land in Argentina in accordance with the recommendations of the expedition. This happened at the very moment when the Moscow catastrophe had broken out, resulting in a panic flight from Russia to North and South America, and partly to Palestine. Baron Hirsch decided that it was his first duty to regulate the emigration movement from Russia, and he made another attempt to enter into negotiations with the Russian government. With this end in view, he sent his representative to St. Petersburg, the Englishman Arnold White, a member of parliament belonging to the parliamentary anti-alien group, who was opposed to foreign immigration to England on the ground of its harmful effect upon the interest of the native working men. Simultaneously, White was commissioned to travel through the Pale of Settlement and find out whether it would be possible to obtain there an element fit for agricultural colonization in Argentina. White arrived in St. Petersburg in May and was received by Povetonos chef and several ministers. The martyrdom of the Moscow Jews was then at its height. Shouts of indignation were ringing through the air of Europe and America, protesting against the barbarism of the Russian government, and the latter was infuriated both by these protests and the recent refusal of Rothschild to participate in the Russian law. The high dignitaries of St. Petersburg, who had been disturbed in their work of Jew baiting by the outcry of the civilized world, gave full vent to their hatred in their conversations with the Baron Hirsch's deputy. White reported afterwards that the functionaries of St. Petersburg had painted to him the Russian Jew as a compound of thief and usurer. Povetonos chef delivered himself of the following malicious observation. The Jew is a parasite. Remove him from the living organism in which and on which he exists, and put this parasite on a rock, and he will die. While thus justifying before the distinguished foreigner their system of destroying the five million Jewish parasites, the Russian ministers were nevertheless glad to lend a helping hand in removing them from Russia on condition that in the course of 12 years a large part of the Jews should be transferred from the country. In the confidential talks with White, three million emigrants were mentioned as the proposed figure. White was furnished with letters of recommendation from the Pobiedonos chef and the Minister of the Interior to the highest officials in the provinces, whither the London delegate betook himself to get acquainted with the living export material. He visited Moscow, Kiev, Berdychev, Odessa, Kherson, and the Jewish agricultural colonies in South Russia. After looking closely at Jewish conditions, White became convinced that the perverted type of Jew which had been painted to him in St. Petersburg was evolved from the inner consciousness of certain orthodox statesmen and has no existence in fact. Wherever he went, he saw men who were sober, industrious, enterprising businessmen, efficient artisans, whose physical weakness was merely the result of insufficient nourishment. His visit to the South Russian colonies convinced him of the fitness of the Jews for colonization. In short, he writes in his report, if courage, moral courage, hope, patience, temperance are fine qualities, then the Jews are a fine people. Such a people, on the wise direction, is destined to make a success of any well-organized plan of colonization, whether in Argentina, Siberia, or South Africa. On his return to London, White submitted a report to Baron Hirsch stating the above facts and also pointing out that the assistance which should be rendered to the emigration work by the Russian government ought to take the form of granting permission to organize in Russia emigration committees of relieving the emigrants of the passport tax 
and of allowing them free transportation up to the Russian border. 2. The Jewish Colonization Association and Collapse of the Argentinian Scheme White's report was discussed by Baron Hirsch in conjunction with the leading Jews of Western Europe. As a result, the decision was reached to establish a society which should undertake on a large scale the colonization of Argentina and other American territories with Russian Jews. The society was founded in London in the autumn of 1891 under the name of the Jewish Colonization Association, JCA, in the form of a stock company with a capital of 50 million francs, which was almost entirely subscribed by Baron Hirsch. White was dispatched to St. Petersburg a second time to obtain permission for organizing the emigration committees in Russia and to secure the necessary privileges for the emigrants. The English delegate, who was familiar with the frame of mind of the leading government circles in Russia, unfolded before them the far-reaching plans of Baron Hirsch. The Jewish Colonization Association was to transplant 25,000 Jews to Argentina in the course of 1892, and henceforward to increase progressively the ratio of emigrants so that in the course of 25 years, 3,250,000 Jews would be taken out of Russia. This brilliant perspective of a Jewish exodus cheered the hearts of the neo-Egyptian dignitaries. Their imagination caught fire. When the question came up before the Committee of Ministers, the Minister of the Navy, Chikachev, proposed to pay the Jewish Colonization Association a bonus of a few rubles for each emigrant and thus enable it to transfer no less than 130,000 people during the very first year, so that the contemplated number of 3,250,000 might be distributed evenly over 25 years. A suggestion was also made to transplant the Jews with their own money, i.e. to use the residue of the Jewish meat tax for that purpose. But the suggestion was not considered feasible. The official chronicler testifies that the fascinating proposition of Baron Hirsch appeared to the Russian government hardly capable of realization. Nevertheless, prompted by the hope that at least part of the contemplated millions of Jews would leave Russia, the government sanctioned the establishment of a central committee of the Jewish Colonization Association in St. Petersburg with branches in the provinces. It further promised to issue to the emigrants free of charge permits to leave the country and to relieve them from military duty on condition that they never return to Russia. In May 1893, the constitution of the Jewish Colonization Association was ratified by the Tsar. At that time, the emigration tide of the previous year was gradually ebbing. The flight from Russia to North and South America had reached its climax in the summer and autumn of 1891. The expulsion from Moscow, as well as alarming rumors of imminent persecutions on the one hand, and exaggerated news about the plans of Baron Hirsch on the other, had resulted in uprooting tens of thousands of people. Huge masses of refugees had flocked to Berlin, Hamburg, Antwerp, and London, imploring to be transferred to the United States or to the Argentinian colonies. Everywhere, relief committees were being organized, but there was no way of forwarding the emigrants to their new destination, particularly to Argentina, where the large territories purchased by Hirsch were not yet ready for the reception of colonists. Baron Hirsch was compelled to send out an appeal to all Jewish communities, calling upon them to stem, for the present, this disorderly human avalanche. Ere long, Baron Hirsch's dream of transplanting millions of people with millions of money proved an utter failure. When, after long preparations, the selected Jewish colonists were at last dispatched to Argentina, it was found 
that the original figure of 25,000 emigrants calculated for the first year had shrunk to about 2,500. Altogether, during the first three years, from 1892 to 1894, the Argentinian emigration absorbed some 6,000 people. Half of these remained in the capital of the Republic, in Buenos Aires, while the other half managed to settle in the colonies after enduring all the hardships connected with an agricultural colonization in a new land and under new climatic conditions. A few years later, it was commonly realized that the mountain had given birth to a mouth. Instead of the million Jews, as originally planned, the Jewish Colonization Association succeeded in transplanting during the first decade only 10,000 Jews who were distributed over six Argentinian colonies. The main current of Jewish emigration flowed as heretofore in the direction of North America towards the United States and Canada. In the course of the year 1891, with its numerous panics, the United States alone observed more than 100,000 emigrants, over 42,000 whom succeeded in arriving the same year, while 76,000 were held back in various European centers and managed to come over the year after. The following two years show again the former annual ratio of emigration, wavering between 30,000 to 35,000. The same fateful year of 1891 gave rise to a colonization fever even in quiet Palestine. Already in the beginning of 1890, the Russian government had legalized the Palestinian colonization movement in Russia by sanctioning the constitution of the society for granting assistance to Jewish colonists and artisans in Syria and Palestine, which had its headquarters in Odessa. This sanction enabled the Hobebe Zion societies, which were scattered all over the country, to group themselves around the legalized center and collect money openly for their purposes. The Palestinian propaganda gained a new lease of life. This propaganda, which was intensified in its effect by the emigration panic of the terrible year, resulted in the formation of a number of societies in Russia with the object of purchasing land in Palestine. In the beginning of 1891, delegates of these societies suddenly appeared in Palestine en masse and with the cooperation of a Jaffa representative of the Odessa Palestine Society, began feverishly buy up the land from the Arabs. This led to a real estate speculation which artificially raised the price of land. Moreover, the Turkish government became alarmed and forbade the wholesale colonization of Jews from Russia. The result was a financial crash. The attempt at a wholesale immigration into destitute Palestine with its primitive patriarchal conditions proved a failure. During the following years, the colonization of the Holy Land with Russian Jews proceed again at a slow pace. One colony after another rose gradually into being. A large part of the old and the new settlers were under the charge of Baron Rothschild administration, with the exception of two or three colonies which were maintained by the Palestine Society in Odessa. It was evident that in view of the slow advance of the Palestinian colonization, its political and economic importance for the Russian Jewish millions was practically nil, and that its only advantage over and against the American Emigration Day in its spiritual significance, in the fact that on the historic soil of Judaism there rose into being a small Jewish center with a purer national culture than was possible in the diaspora. This idea was championed by Ahad Ham, the exponent of the Neo-Palestine movement, who had made his first appearance in Hebrew literature in 1889 and, in a short time, forged his way to the front. 3. Continued Humiliations and Death of Alexander III In the meantime, in the land of the Tsars, 
events went their own course. The Moscow tragedy was nearing its end, but its last stages were marked by scenes reminiscent of the times of the Inquisition. After banishing from Moscow the larger part of the Jewish population, the governor-general, Grand Duke Sergius, made up his mind to humble the remaining Jewish population of the second Russian capital so thoroughly that its existence in the center of Greek orthodoxy might escape public notice. The eyes of the Russian officials at Moscow were offended by the sight of the new beautiful synagogue structure, which had been finished in the fateful year of the expulsion. At first, orders were given to remove from the top of the building the large cupola kept by the shield of David, which attracted the attention of all passers-by. Later on, the police, without any further ado, shut down the synagogue in which services had already begun to be held, pending the receipt of a new special permit to reopen it. Rabbi Mine of Moscow and the warden of the synagogue addressed a petition to the governor-general in which they begged permission to hold services in the building, the construction of which had been duly sanctioned by the government, pointing to the fact that Judaism was one of the religions tolerated in Russia. In answer to their petition, they received the following stern reply from St. Petersburg, dated September 23, 1892. His Imperial Majesty, after listening to a report of the Minister of the Interior concerning the willful opening of the Moscow Synagogue by Rabbi Minor and Warden Schneider, was graciously pleased to comment as follows. First, Rabbi Minor of Moscow shall be dismissed from his post and transferred for permanent residence to the Pale of Jewish Settlement. Second, Warden Schneider shall be removed from the precincts of Moscow for two years. Third, the Jewish Synagogue Society shall be notified that unless by January 1st, 1893, the synagogue structure will have been sold or transformed into a charitable institution, it will be sold at public auction by the gubernatorial administration of Moscow. The rabbi and the warden went to exile, while the dead body of the murdered synagogue, its structure, was saved from desecration by placing in it one of the schools of the Moscow community. The fight against the places of Jewish worship was renewed by the police a few years later during the reign of Nicholas II. The principal synagogue being closed, the Jews of Moscow were compelled to hold services in uncomfortable private premises. There were 14 houses of prayer of this kind in various parts of the city, but on the eve of the Jewish Passover of 1894, the governor-general gave orders to close nine of these houses so that the religious needs of a community of 10,000 souls had to be satisfied in five houses of worship, situated in narrow, unsanitary quarters. The government had achieved its purpose. The synagogue was humbled into the dust, and its sight no longer offended the eyes of the Greek Orthodox zealots. The Jews of Moscow were forced to pour out their hearts before God in some backyard in the stuffy atmosphere of private dwellings. As in the days of the Spanish Inquisition, these private houses of worship would, on the solemn days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, be stealthily visited by the Maranos of Moscow, those Jews who had saved themselves from the wholesale expulsions by fictitious conversion to Christianity. The passionate prayers of repentance of these involuntary apostates rose up to heaven, as they had done in centuries gone by, from the underground synagogues of Seville, Toledo, and Zaragoza. By and by, the attempt to take the Jewish citadel by storm gave way to the former regular state of siege, which had for its object to starve out the Jews. The municipal county reform of 1892 dealt a severe political blow to Russian Jewry. Under the old law, the number of Jewish aldermen in the municipal administration had been limited to one-third of the total number of aldermen, 
aside from the prohibition barring the Jews from the office of burgomaster. Notwithstanding these restrictions, the Jews played a conspicuous part in municipal self-government and could boast of a number of prominent municipal workers. This activity of the Jews went against the grain of the inquisitorial trio, Pobyodonoschev, Durunovo, and Plev, and they decided to bar the Jews completely from participation in the municipal elections. The reactionary anti-democratic municipal regulation of 1892 proclaimed publicly this new Jewish disfranchisement. The new law deprived the Jews of their right of passive and active election to the municipal dumas, merely granting the local administration the right to appoint at its pleasure a number of Jewish aldermen, not to exceed one-tenth of the total membership of the Duma. Moreover, these Jewish aldermen, by the grace of the police, were prohibited from serving on the executive organs of the Duma, the administrative council, and the various standing committees. As a result, even there where the Jews formed 60 or 70 percent of the total urban population, their only representatives in the municipal administration were men who were the willing tools of the municipal powers and who, moreover, were quantitatively restricted to 5 or 10 percent of the total number of aldermen. In this wise, the law providing for an inverse ratio of popular representation came into effect. Four-fifths of the population were limited to one-tenth of the number of aldermen, while one-fifth of it were granted nine-tenths of aldermen in the city government. The law seemed to tell the Jews, true, in the given city you may form the overwhelming majority of taxpayers, yet the city property shall not be managed by you, but by the small Christian minority, which shall do with you as it pleases. It goes without saying that the Christian minority, which was not infrequently hostile to the Jews, managed the city affairs in a manner subversive of the interest of the majority. Even the imposts on special Jewish needs, such as the meat and candle tax, were often used by the municipal dumas towards the maintenance of institutions and schools to which Jews were admitted in an insignificant number or not admitted at all. This condition of affairs was in full accord with the medieval church canons. A Jew living in a Christian country has no right to dispose of any property and must remain in slavish subjection to his Christian fellow citizens. A number of laws passed during that period are of such a nature as to admit of but one explanation, the desire to insult and humiliate the Jews and to brand him by the medieval Keynes mark of persecution. The law, issued in 1893, concerning names, threatens with criminal persecution those Jews who in their private life call themselves by names differing in form from those recorded in the official registers. The practice of many educated Jews to Russianize their names, such as Gregory instead of Hirsch, Vladimir instead of Wolf, etc., could now land the culprits in prison. It was even forbidden to correct the disfigurements to which the Jewish names were generally subjected in the registers, such as Yosel instead of Joseph, Shrul instead of Israel, Itzek instead of Isaac, and so on. In several cities, the police brought actions against such Jews for having adopted Christian names in newspaper advertisements, on visiting cards, or on door signs. The new passport regulation of 1894 orders to insert in all Jewish passports a physical description of their owners, even in the case of their being literate, and therefore being able to affix their signature to the passports, whereas such description was omitted from the passports of literate Christians. In some places, the police deliberately tried to make the Jewish passport more conspicuous by marking on them the denomination of the owner in red ink. Even in those rare instances in which the law was intended to bring relief 
the government managed to emphasize its hostile intent. The law of 1893, legalizing the Jewish header and putting an end to the persecution, which this traditional Jewish school had suffered at the hands of the police, narrowed at the same time its function to that of an exclusively religious institution and indirectly obeyed the teaching in it of the general secular subjects. There are cases on record in which the keepers of these headers, so-called melamets, were put on trial for imparting to their pupils a knowledge of Russian and arithmetic. However, the most effective whip in the hands of the government remained as there to fall, the expulsion from the governments of the interior. In 1893, this whip crept over the backs of thousands of Jewish families. Durunovo, the minister of the interior, issued a circular repealing the old decree of 1880, which had sanctioned the residence outside the pale of settlement of all those Jews who had lived there previously. That decree had been prompted by the motive to prevent the complete economic ruin of the Jews who were settled in places outside the pale and had created their industrial enterprises. But such a motive, which even the anti-Semitic ministry of Tolstoy had not been bold enough to disregard, did not appeal to the new Hamans. Many thousands of Jewish families who had lived outside the pale for decades were threatened with exile. The difficulties attending the execution of this wholesale expulsion forced the government to make concessions. In the Baltic provinces, the banishment of the old settlers was repealed, while in the great Russian governments it was postponed for a year or two. There was a particularly spiteful motive behind the imperial UK case of 1893, excluding the Crimean resort place Yalta from the pale of settlement and ordering the expulsion from there of hundreds of families which were not enrolled in the local town community. No official reason was given for this new disability, but everybody knew it. In the neighborhood of Yalta was the imperial summer residence Livadia, where Alexander III was fond of spending the autumn, and this circumstance made it imperative to reduce the number of the local Jewish residents to a negligible quantity. To avert the complete ruin of the victims, many were granted reprieves, but after the expiration of their terms, they were ruthlessly deported. The last batches of exiles were driven from Yalta in the month of October and in the beginning of November 1894, during the days of public mourning for the death of Alexander III. On October 20, the Tsar was destined to die in the neighborhood of the town, which was purged of the Jewish populace for his benefit. While the old remains of the dead emperor were carried on the railroad track to St. Petersburg, trains filled with Jewish refugees from Yalta were rolling on the parallel tracks, speeding towards the Pale of Settlement. Such was the symbolic finale of the reign of Alexander III, which lasted 14 years. Having begun with pogroms, it ended with expulsions. The martyred nation stood at the threshold of a new reign with a silent question on its lip. What next? End of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland Volume 2 From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III 1825-1894 to 1894, By Shimon Dubunov Translated by Israel Friedlander